So I'm visiting Hollywood for the first time uh, in my life. And if you've ever been to Hollywood, it is completely different to Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> the buildings are different, the food's different, the culture's different. It is a lot different to Tassie, as I mentioned. And as I'm walking down the boulevard of Hollywood, it's a fine summer's uh, afternoon, looking at the stars on the ground. I'm approached by a man in a grey suit. And the man in the grey suit was offering me a free personality test. I'm like, I've always wanted to know more about myself. Why not? I'm in Hollywood. Let's do it. So I followed him inside into what seemed like a huge mansion. And inside, there was more people in grey suits. <laughs> anyway, as I'm following him down, he leads me to a classroom setting where he offers me to do uh, the personality test. Well, two hours later, I finally finished his personality test and I was waiting for my results. And so I'm sitting there, I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. I don't know where I am, I'm in a new place, and I still don't know why there's so many people in grey suits. So the results come back and he walks me into a dark back room, it was like an alleyway. He sits me down and walks me through my test results and he was showing me everything that was wrong with me. <laughs> But it's okay, because he had a, a solution to all of my problems at a cost, of course. And this, like many people, when they first get into cryptocurrency, is that feeling of being overwhelmed, selling solutions to problems you don't have at a cost. And my story isn't unique. A lot of the experts out there in crypto right now is probably your Uber driver, right, telling you what crypto to buy. And we've all got, all got that mate, right, that messages us about that cryptocurrency we should buy, but we never listen to him. Or the YouTuber or TikTok influencer. Although these people might be passionate, they're not necessarily experts. So today I'm going to try and do my best to teach you about the world of cryptocurrency and why you should care about it. Because I believe right now is the time to understand. We're on the cusp of one of the greatest technological revolutions and financial revolutions of our time. Can I get a show of hands? Who uses Apple Pay here on their phone? Awesome. Any gamers in the room? Maybe PlayStation gamers or anyone plays Candy Crush? Earns little tokens or points, frequent flyers or, or credit card uh, yeah, points, awesome. These are all examples of digital assets. Just because something can't be touched, smelt, or, or felt doesn't mean it doesn't have value. The value at the core is something that you and I believe that has value and that we can use it for everyday things. The money that we have right now, if we go back 40, 50 years ago, you used to be able to go into a bank and transfer that money for gold. It actually used to be backed by something. Nowadays, we went off that system and the money we have in our pocket isn't really backed by too much. Predominantly, it's backed by trust. Now, a lot of these digital assets, as we just mentioned, are what we call centralized digital assets. We don't really own these assets. We just have the right to use them for a particular point in time. That's why those pesky credit card points seem to go out of date right at the wrong time. This is the opposite to decentralized digital assets. In a decentralized world, there is no central business or authority that owns those assets. We are in complete control. An example of this might be a decentralized computer game where we earn the points and we can cash them out for dollars. We can send them to a friend and they live long beyond the end of that game. So to understand how this decentralization works, we first need to understand blockchain. Now I'm going to try and understand. I'm going to try and explain blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin, everything about this without slides. So I'm going, to, I'm going to do my best. So blockchain is the ability for us to transfer information, data, currency, without the need of a middleman. So I can send money without a bank. I can download data without Dropbox, or I can listen to music without Spotify. We can all do this through the use of blockchain. Now, you can think of blockchain like a database. Instead of the data being stored by a centralized company or business, like we spoke about with our Candy Crush example, in a decentralized world, the data is owned by us. Everyone in the network owns a piece of that data. Who here remembers uTorrent or LimeWire, where you used to download movies, right? Yeah, I see you guys. <laughs> this wasn't a blockchain, but it was an example of how a blockchain works. What it did was it connected us with someone online, peer-to-peer, -peer, which allowed us to download a movie. And it did that peer-to-peer -peer without the need of a middle person. uTorrent or LimeWire was simply the software that allowed it to happen. And this is why I'm so excited about the idea of decentralization and cryptocurrencies, because you are in control and we don't need a middleman to do that. 
Now, most cryptocurrencies and digital assets are built on blockchains. There's actually over 13,000 different cryptocurrencies out there. The best cryptocurrencies solve a problem, like any good business. And most cryptocurrencies are like businesses. But instead of shares representing the ownership, we have tokens or cryptocurrencies. There's two main types of cryptocurrencies. One is a currency token, and the second is a utility token. The biggest currency token that we know right now is Bitcoin. We've probably all heard of Bitcoin. The reason Bitcoin is so popular is it's trying to overtake or be another version of currency, just like the Australian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, US dollar, only digital. I can send Bitcoin anywhere in the world instantly with little to no fees. Through decentralization as well, we have the ability to understand how many Bitcoins will ever be created through software. There's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever created. This can never change. This is the opposite to most government-backed currencies. Over the past few years, a lot of the currency has been printed into the economy to stimulate due to the COVID. One of the reasons or one of the things that happens when you print so much money at a simple level is you get this thing called inflation. That's why my cup of coffee cost me $6 this morning on my way here. When you print this much money, it inflates the cost of living. And it's why Bitcoin has become so popular because you can never inflate the number of Bitcoins created. When you get an increase in demand, but the supply stays the same, you get this increase in price. And that's why Bitcoin's become so popular. I used to run a sportswear company um, back when I was uh, younger in Tasmania. We used to manufacture garments from Pakistan and China and sell them to sporting teams in Tasmania. And I'd send $20,000 worth of basically Australian dollars over to China every month. By the time I'd send that $20,000 every month to China, it would only be worth around $17,000. And it'd take only two weeks to arrive. Why did it take so long? And, and who took the $3,000? Well, the middleman took that the banks. If I was to do the same transaction in cryptocurrency, I could have bought $20,000 worth of crypto, sent it directly to China, and literally within seconds they would have taken that with little to no fees, transferred it to the local Chinese yuan, and started building my garments. In a world where speed, transparency, and the fast-paced nature of cryptocurrencies, this is why I believe this is the future of finance. The second type of cryptocurrency, as I mentioned before, is the utility token. The second biggest type of cryptocurrency here is called Ethereum, and Ethereum is the utility token. Now, with Ethereum, we can build what's called smart contracts. Now, you're probably thinking, Ben, geez, shut up, a lot of, uh, a lot of big words here. <laughs> but with smart contracts, we can basically build programmable businesses, games, NFTs, all without the need of a middleman. A really basic example of how a smart contract would work is a vending machine. So we think about a vending machine, we put in the $2, we press what Coke or Powerade we want, and it spits out that drink. It does that every single time without the need of a person to do that transaction. What Ethereum does is take that smart contract idea at a global scale to build global businesses. One of the biggest ideas and biggest use cases I've seen for Ethereum and smart contracts is this idea of decentralized finance or DeFi. With DeFi, I can take out a loan or earn interest on my savings without the need to go to a bank. For those that own a mortgage, anyone here is paying off a mortgage right now? <laughs> you know how much money you're spending and sending it to the bank? Have you wondered where that money actually goes? Based on where you're putting in your savings, you're probably only earning 0.1%, maybe 0.2%. All that money that you pay in interest goes directly to the middle person. With DeFi, there is no middle person. DeFi matches you if you're taking out a loan directly with the person that's putting up their savings. So it reduces the interest you have to pay and any interest you pay goes directly to the person that's actually putting up their savings. This is another reason why I think the future of cryptocurrency, decentralization and digital assets is so important because it's giving us, us back control. It's giving us back the ownership and it's taking out that middle person. So how are you feeling about cryptocurrencies now? Are you scared, excited, nervous? I remember when I first got into this space, it was completely overwhelming. So I'm on a mission to try and help educate and help everyone understand this space. As we've seen today, cryptocurrencies and digital assets are already being used by us in everyday lives without us even knowing about it. 
Cryptocurrency is already being used as legal tender as place, in places like Venezuela, El Salvador, where their local currency is inflated so much they actually can't use their currency too much anymore. And it's also being used in places like Miami, where you can pay taxes in it. Australia could be next. My favourite pastime uh, used to be going to Blockbuster on a Friday night with my mum, my dad, my brother and my sister. We used to get the VCRs out, sit on the couch and watch our movies on a Friday. Blockbuster used to be a global company. It used to have thousands of stores globally. But in 2010, Blockbuster went bankrupt. Blockbuster went bankrupt because it failed to see the digital transformation that was happening right in front of its eyes. In fact, Netflix actually pitched Blockbuster the idea of sitting in your home, on your couch, downloading a movie within seconds. And Blockbuster laughed them out of the room. A few years later, Netflix is now worth over $100 billion and has over 200 million customers. So the lesson here that Blockbuster learned pretty hard was that digital transformations happen regardless of your personal opinion. They happen based on what's better for humanity and what makes life better and simpler for everyday people. So the question I have for you today is, who do you want to be? Blockbuster or Netflix? <laughs> <laughs>